cool. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Sydney. I work at the Colorado Working Families Party. And before I get started passing it off to Amanda, I wanted to make sure we just did a quick tech run through. I'll be doing that tonight. Um, I assume many of us have been on lots of Zoom calls these past few months, but wanted to make sure that everybody knows um, you can, we're going to ask folks to stay on mute um, unless we open things up for discussion and um, you can start and stop your video at the bottom of the screen. You can also use reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So you can do a thumbs up or clap. Um, and if you want to say something, there's also, if you click participants um, at the bottom, you can um, open up a tab that allows you to raise your hand um, and we will be able to see that and um, yeah, call you up. We'll also be using the chat function tonight. Um, so make sure you're able to see the chat so that you can um, yeah, do some of our interactive participatory stuff here. And with that, I'll pass it off to Amanda to get us started. Oh, actually the one final thing, sorry, that I just remembered is that for questions, I'm assuming many of you will have questions. So for questions tonight, um, please, we're gonna ask people to use, there's a Q and A um, function at the bottom toolbar um, on Zoom. Um, if you could submit questions using the Q&A, that would be great. And then we can um, see those as they come up and answer them. We'll answer all of them at the end. Don't see a Q&A. You don't see it? Oh, hold on. There is a chat function. Yeah, it should be. Are other people able to see the Q and A? No. Okay, then so maybe let's just. That's okay. So yeah, it must be not enabled tonight. So let's just do the chat for questions, and we'll make sure to save the questions, and we we'll get to all of them at the end. Awesome. Um, you know, we're all going to be pros at all of these virtual platforms uh, by the time a vaccine arrives, right? We're all going to feel so smart. Um, so thank you, as Sydney said, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's a broad coalition of folks that have worked on um, this campaign finance policy. My name is Amanda Gonzalez, and I'm the executive director of Colorado Common Cause, and honored to be um, among the group of folks that uh, worked really hard to, to put this policy together. And so I'm glad that all of you could join us today. Um, I know that uh, there's a million things that everyone could be doing. And so um, it's exciting that you're joining us. Um, I briefly just want to give an overview of kind of why we're here tonight. So as I said, we're going to be discussing campaign finance in Aurora. Um, and at the end of the day, I think all of us want a system where everybody's voice is heard and where everyone plays by fair common sense rules, right? When we have lots of dollars coming in from special interest, I think especially if you're the kind of person um, who doesn't feel like you have a lot of extra money in your home budget to contribute to um, candidates, even if you really, really like those folks, um, you're worried that there could be impropriety, right? Or the appearance of impropriety. And I think all of us want a political system where we can trust um, that politicians have our best interest at heart, right? And so currently, um, the city of Aurora doesn't have any campaign finance limits. And the disclosure requirements are pretty weak. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, tried to figure out who's trying to influence your vote or who's trying to influence um, folks running for office, but it can be pretty tricky and hard to do. Um, and so really at the end of the day, we feel like no one should be able to just outright buy a city council seat or a mayor seat. Um, and that more accountability means that there will be less corruption and all of us can have more trust in our city's government. Um, and so that's really why um, the team that has been working on this policy for the last several months came together. And I think hopefully why many of you are here tonight. 
Um, later in the program, so towards the end, we will be talking about next steps, ways that you can get involved. There's a number of city council meetings that are coming up in the next few weeks, uh, and your voice uh, would be really, really helpful in that process. So we'll, we'll get to all those details a little bit later in the program. Uh, but first, we want to hear a little bit from you all. So we have a program uh, that some of you may have used if you're Zoom experts by now and you've been doing a bunch of these um, interactive webinars, um, but it's called the Mentee. And so what we're going to do is we have like a little survey for you um, and you are going to need to bring up a second window. So if you're on a computer, um, now's a great time to open up your browser as Sydney kind of pulls up our group participation portion. Um, and we'll be doing this a couple different times. So it's pretty easy to use once we get the screen share hopped over there. Can you all see it? Yeah, we are looking at the um, PowerPoint still. Oh, okay. Let's see. There we go. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so it's right on your screen. If you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, um, in a new window somewhere in your browser, um, I know you really want to see my beautiful face, uh, but check out, <laughs> it'll ask you to enter a code, and that's right at the top there. It's also in the chat, so you're going to type in that code 5017024. Um, Again, it's in your chat and on your screen. So 5017024, and you'll be able to participate uh, in the group participation portion right now. Um, so here's what we want to know from you to start. The first thing we want to know is when you think about campaign finance, what are the words that come to mind, right? And this is how it currently is now. So, um, you know, I'm all for optimism. We're gonna get to that piece. But as you think about campaign finance right now and how it works, what words come to mind? Uh, does it feel fair? Does it feel unfair? Um, does it feel like it's everyday people participating? Does it feel like it's special interests or corporations? Do you feel like your voice is heard? Um, yeah, so as you were starting to populate in, but um, I know we've got more than a dozen folks joining us tonight, so keep plopping in those words um, of how campaign finance currently feels to you. Awesome. So there's still time to put your words in, but we're, we're getting some in, so it, it feels complex. It feels like it's about um, big money and corruption and ooh, plutocracy, that's a good one. Um, that the system maybe feels confusing or rigged or imbalanced, that it's not something that um, it feels like maybe everybody on this call feels like they can um, understand and participate in. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I definitely understand all of that, right? That this is maybe a system for wealthy people. Um, or maybe out of state interest. Um, yeah, I, okay, I think that's really helpful and it's, it tells us that um, we all kind of have some of the same concerns about this maybe isn't reflecting some of our values. I don't know, maybe your values corruption, but not mine. Um, all right, so let's, let's moving forward. Um, how should this work, right? If, if you had the power, um, and I'm gonna spend the next little bit of time trying to convince you that people do have the power um, and that's why we need your voice in this process. Um, but when you think about how it should be, how campaign finance laws should work, um, that if you all were designing the system and we're gonna ask you to, um, what would that look like? What would it be like if, if all of us got to design a campaign finance system that reflected our values and how we think that the system should work? Awesome, stuff is starting to roll in. So it's accessible, it should be transparent, should be fair, should be equal for all of us. Um, should be people powered, um, thorough. Uh, there should be limits, should be equitable. Those are great, I love that. Grassroots pops up, um, these are really great. Yeah, I think this is the system um, that all of us want. We want it to be comprehensive and making sure that it protects our voices. 
publicly financed comes up, uh, we will get there. <laughs> immediate transparency. Folks want to know what's going on, right? Who's trying to influence their vote? Who's trying to influence elected officials? That's awesome. Thank you so much for, um, for participating in that. And we're going to kind of hang on to those ideas as we continue. Uh, so the next part that I want to talk about is we have um, an ordinance that is making its way to council. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about what is in that ordinance. Um, we've simplified it down. Um, to a couple key ideas. So, um, Cindy, if we can hop back over. Perfect. Oh, look at that. That's magic. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about what this reform does. So there's three key parts. The first is that it creates new limits on campaign contributions. So we saw that in what you all were looking for, that um, you shouldn't just be able to buy a council seat, right? Um, it has stronger reporting requirements to stop secret spending and to help all of you get that transparency that you're looking for and understand what's going on um, in a reasonable amount of time. Right? Stella, this isn't a trash can. Come over here and clean this out. You can't be putting trash in here. This is ridiculous. Right. I can't believe this. I'm so surprised by this. Just a quick reminder, and we'll probably do it on the back end too, but um, if you're not on mute, go ahead and hit that mute button at the bottom of your screen and we'll keep Plug it along. The third and final part of the policy is that it creates stronger oversight and enforcement, right? That if you have a bunch of rules, but they don't have any teeth, um, it's kind of hard to get folks to pay attention to them. All right, so let's talk a little bit about those new limits. Um, we can go to the next slide. Awesome. Um, so this creates new contribution limits for city candidates. Um, and it will ensure that those who seek public office are accountable and responsible to individual constituents, right? That you don't have wealthy special interests financing whole campaigns. Um, we have new comprehensive restrictions on the coordination between campaigns and outside groups. So that's, we've gotten away from maybe a way to hide money in different places. Um, we have comprehensive restrictions on the use of campaign funds. Right, so this talks about what candidates and committees can spend um, their the money that is donated to them, what they can spend that on. Um, and then we're creating small donor committees that will bring more people into the political process and augment the voices of everyday people in local elections. So this is a way um, that, you know, maybe you're somebody that your household budget only allows you to contribute $25 to a candidate that you really, really believe in. Um, these small donor committees will be able to bring more power to those smaller donors. Um, and this whole sort of contribution limit scheme brings Aurora more in line um, with state limits and the other municipal limits that exist in many cities um, that neighbor Aurora. So contribution limits is our, our first big principle of this campaign finance reform. The next one, which we'll talk about on the next slide here, um, is to increase transparency and disclosure, right? So we're, we've made stronger reporting requirements for outside groups that pay for independent expenditures and pre-election ads about candidates or ballot questions in Aurora, right? So under the ordinance, outside groups um, that spend $1,000 or more on political ads in Aurora will have to file comprehensive reports disclosing their big donors, right? So you'll get to know who's paying for those ads you're seeing, um, even if it's an outside group. Uh, there's also new disclaimer requirements for political advertising in Aurora. So those paid for by statements that you might see other places that name the sponsors of political ads and if it's possible whether those ads are supported by PACs or outside groups. Um, and that will also require those groups to identify their largest donors. Um, you know, so I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I see those statewide ads that say, you know, paid for by Coloradans who love puppies. And I was like, well, I don't know any Coloradans who love puppies. Who are these folks? What are they trying to tell me? This will help you understand who's trying to influence your vote. Um, and then the last part is that candidates, political committees, and issue committees will have to file additional disclosure reports on a regular basis. Um, and this will include more detailed and accurate information about all contributions received and all expenditures. That way voters will understand um, in a more timely manner sort of what 
what money is coming into elections, right? Maybe you want to um, kind of think about that as you're deciding who to vote for, whether or not you want to believe the ad um, that came to your door. So you'll be able to better understand how campaign finance is working in your city. Um, and then the last key tenant on the next slide is about stronger oversight and enforcement, right? So we've created a more streamlined um, process and procedures for investigating and taking action against potential violations for campaign finance laws. So everybody, candidates and voters, will be able to understand how enforcement works. That seems pretty important, right? Um, and then we've enhanced the penalties for campaign finance violation, and this includes penalties up to $10,000 for those who intentionally, right, violate the city's campaign finance re um, requirements. This isn't about trying to play gotcha. Um, it's really about making it so that um, candidates can understand how the laws work. It's about making sure that voters can understand um, who's following the laws. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have that process all be more frequent so that voters don't have to wait till months after an election to figure out what's going on. Um, so those are the, the, the big picture, the key parts of um, the reforms that we're hoping will take place in Aurora and that we hope will benefit all voters and elected officials. Um, and next, I'm going to pass it over to Owen, who's going to talk a little bit more about the big picture and how this is specifically going to impact all of us. Sorry. Uh, thanks. This is Owen Perkins, and I'm uh, with the Coalition and with Clean Slate Now Action. I think we're going to do another of our slides here um, to get a sense for what the issues are that are most important to you all. So um, if you, I guess you can choose uh, any of those choices below, and I think there's an option for other. Um, what are the most important issues to you? So if you can go back to your page, um, your menti.com, and uh, see what's the, the top issues for various people in the room. Um, there's uh, any number of issues uh, that, that come out at the top of people's lists. Um, and, uh, well, I'm trying to see all the choices there. Uh, we've got income inequality, police reform, uh, affordable housing, climate, healthcare, campaign finance, doing well, uh, affordable housing at the top, and that's great. And you know, this is a select, self-selecting group. You'd kind of think campaign finance would do well. But what's important to remember is that all of these issues really come back to campaign finance. You can't have any of the progress you want on these particular issues until we solve the problem of campaign finance. Um, it, our system is broken right now, and it's, it, I guess it depends on your values. If you like an uh, uh, election system that really favors the wealthy and gives advantages to those with access to wealth, gives corporations and special interests special advantages, then the current system probably works for you. But we're trying to do something that empowers regular, regular people, regular residents of Aurora, um, regular voters, and give them the opportunity to get off the sidelines of their own democracy and get down onto the field where they can start calling the plays. The Supreme Court decisions from earlier uh, in the last 10 years or so really opened the floodgates for big money. And I think you all identified a lot of the, the big problems that we're trying to address with this um, reform. Uh, $3 billion came into the 2016 election that hadn't been there before these Supreme Court decisions were allowed in. Now the Supreme Court obviously in, in Citizens United said uh, money is speech um, and they're protecting people's right to speech. But don't forget that you also, you don't have to be a big mega corporation to have your right to speech protected. Um, people of modest means also have to have their rights of speech protected. So that's what we're trying to do with these reforms. Uh, trying to look at how regular people are, are still, you know, kept from being drowned out by the big money that comes into politics. We mentioned, Amanda mentioned that you often don't know who the players were until after the election. The Colorado Ethics Watch found that out a few years ago in a study that they did, that people just 
didn't know who was contributing to campaigns until after elections were over. And that lack of transparency um, creates a sense of um, deception and ultimately a feeling of corruption when they see so much money going behind candidates. In Aurora, if you look at particular races, um, just take a typical race. And I, again, affordable housing is the top issue here. There's one race, I'm just gonna call it Ward A, but um, uh, just with our limits, just by imposing campaign limits, which the vast majority of all uh, residents across the political spectrum believe in, you can take out almost half of the money that's playing in that election. And it's, it's um, tens of thousands of dollars, about $40,000 in one district race that came from big donations from corporations and special interests. And if you look at the list, and you can see the way we break that down on cleanslatenowaction.org, our website, um, but uh, it's, um, it's a lot of realtors, a lot of developers, a lot of apartment associations, a lot of condo associations. So say you've got a resident like uh, Maria, who's a school teacher and an Aurora, and, and she believes desperately that we need to do something about affordable housing. When she sees candidates getting tens of thousands of dollars, mostly I would say from, uh, it would add, it's documented from outside of Aurora, representing realtors, developers, developers apartment associations, what's the chance, the likelihood that she's gonna see her goals get met by backing a candidate who's funded by those kind of special interests. When we take out the corporate contributions, which is another thing the ordinance does, it takes out uh, business uh, businesses' abilities to contribute directly to campaigns, and you take out those large contributions, you dramatically change the landscape. And candidates who were being outraised two to one suddenly go into the lead in a race, maybe a smaller lead, but it becomes a competitive race. And somebody who's relying on small dollar donations from regular Aurorans suddenly becomes competitive and can compete with somebody who's raking in huge contributions from corporations and special interests. And the result is that we get candidates who hopefully, you know, that this is our goal and this is the results we see in the dozens of communities that have done it elsewhere these kind of reforms, you start getting candidates who focus their time almost entirely in their community, talking to their constituents, listening to their constituents, knowing that you know they no longer need to spend that time dialing for dollars and getting on the phone trying to attract big wealth. So the impact we see is you know a widespread, we get big greater voter turnout, it increases across the spectrum. You get communities of color much more engaged lower income communities are able to contribute and, and play a role in campaigns that they haven't been able to in the past. Wealth and access to wealth is taken out of the equation. And ultimately we get this diverse field of candidates who really represent the community with what we see in time after time is more women, more young people and more people of color running for and winning elections. So suddenly our school teacher Maria, who cares so much about affordable housing as her top issue, it's not, she's not only a player in the game, she can be a candidate. And with these reforms in place, she can become an elected official having, having succeeded with this citizen owned election where we can finally get leaders and elected officials who prioritize the public interest over the special interest. So that's what we're really trying to do. And I wanna close this segment by taking a look at what we can do as individuals and putting another screen up there for you to contribute to on how you can make a difference um, and how you have made a difference. So check any of these boxes that apply, apply. Have you ever volunteered for a campaign, donated to a political campaign? And then a distinction, have you ever donated over $100 to one candidate? Because it's those big contributions where things get skewed. We wanna, we, we really wanna get people engaged. Um, we wanna get people feeling like these are their campaigns, their elected officials, they represent them and they're beholden to nobody but their constituency. So um, it's good, not surprisingly, we're seeing an active group of people in this room who have volunteered for campaigns and donated. And let's look at the next uh, and last slide on this topic, um, how you can uh, play a role. So as individuals, are we set up to be able to make a real difference on campaigns that we support? And you got a spectrum here um, from yes completely, to no, not at all, and everywhere in between. So find a place that you think 
things fit for you right now in terms of your ability to make an impact on campaigns that you support. Um, and I'm going to transfer as, as we tally those polls over to uh, let us hear from our two council members who are here, Mayor Pro Tem Nicole Johnston and council member Juan Marcano, who are the two co-sponsors of this ordinance. And they're gonna talk more about the impact you can make as individuals in Aurora with this legislation pending before city council. I don't want to jump in, Juan, so I'm, I'm deferring oh, no. to ahead. you first. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, yeah, I also uh, I just want to echo your comment, uh, Mayor Pratem Johnston, that Menti feature is amazing. It's really cool. And I think we should make use of that for our meetings, honestly. Totally. Um, I love it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, so we're both here as the co-sponsors uh, for this ordinance to encourage all of you to get engaged on this. Uh, the policy making is just a portion of this. We need to actually demonstrate that there is popular support um, for these kinds of really important reforms. Because as Owen alluded to, campaign finance touches everything we care about at the city. So whether that's enough firefighters, well-trained you know, police, um, well-maintained roads, all of, you know, affordable housing, all of the above, campaign finance impacts all of that. So uh, there are a number of ways that you can reach out to us and I'll cover a couple and then I'll hand it over to Mayor Pratem Johnson if that's all right. Great. So first, uh, but definitely not least, you are able to engage in public comment. So since this isn't before uh, council as an agenda item just yet, you are able to participate in public invited to be heard. Uh, our next meeting is on November, I'm sorry, November, gosh, uh, September 14th. Um, and you're able to call in starting at seven o'clock and get in line and at 7.30, you will be able to uh, speak to us uh, live on the phone um, and share your thoughts with us. And I would love to see those of y'all who are passionate about this or even those of y'all who, you know, might not necessarily be completely in support but want some more clarification, let us know what you think. Um, the second way you're able to do so is email us. So you can email all of us at citycouncil at auroragov.org, or you can email us individually and all of our emails are available on the city's website. Um, and also, you know, uh, again, ask questions or just, you know, encourage uh, us and our colleagues uh, to, you know, push this really important reform forward. And with that, Mayor Patem, I will yield to you. Thank you. Yes, if you go to auroragov.org and click on Mayor and City Council, you can find the agendas for each of our, our council meetings and our um, policy meetings, and that will have the number of what to call for that. And as Councilmember Marcano said, you know, earlier we were talking about the issues that are important, climate, affordable housing, police reform, and I know campaign finance reform is like, oh, how <laughs> exciting, but it does link as council member Marcano um, alluded to. And I, we, we both personally have been on, on the end of this. So now that we're in the, the elected role, we can do something about it. But when I ran in 2017, the weekend before the election, over $100,000 from the oil and gas industry were poured into um, the opponents for at large um, Ward 1 and Ward 2. Now, it didn't work, and um, our at-large Ward 1 and Ward 2 still won, but that was because they weren't as sophisticated as in the 2019 race that Councilmember Marcano had um, participated in. It was a whole other level of dark money, um, a lot of money poured in to try to prevent um, progressives who wanted change from, from occurring. So what we're trying to do is, is show the importance of this. One, as Amanda said, is that limits part of it, but the other is the disclosure. And it's not just the individual contributions that we're getting as candidates, but it's those independent expenditure committees. It's knowing who's paying money and for voters to have that information and, and to be able to know why before they, they cast that vote. So it's really important. We need at least six votes um, to get to to get to that um, to the, get to that vote, there may be some. I'm just going to say, you know, some other alternatives that are offered 
to not have a strong or a robust system, we, um, Council Member Marcano and I, feel like this is the best product. Any other alternative that has the status quo of basically no penalties, right now it's $50 a day, which when you're a huge industry, would you rather pour a ton of money and not do the reporting um, and deal with the $50 a day or have some big consequences? So we really urge you all to say, yes, we want campaign finance reform, but we want this particular ordinance that is strong and is really going to, to make a, a difference in um, transparency and accountability. And from there, I don't know if we're taking questions or Amanda, I'll take it back to you as kind of the MC. Yeah, so um, we're definitely happy to um, take questions. I think Susan has a couple more kind of uh, participation questions um, as you think about what questions you have for this whole group. So go ahead and type your questions into the chat as you have them. Um, and that way we make sure and get to everybody. And Susan, I think, has some more group participation because we want to know what y'all think. Yeah, we're going to go. Hi, my name is Susan Gilbert. I'm with PDA Colorado Progressive Democrats of America. And uh, we have some more questions for you. We kind of, this is kind of the fun part where in addition to the questions that you have, we have tons of tons of questions in the chat. So we will get to those. Thank you so much for uh, continuing to add those. But I think Sydney, did you want to, there we go. We're gonna kind of kind of go back to where we were now. We kind of, this is kind of the take a temperature of, of where you are now because we're kind of hoping obviously that maybe um, things have changed a little bit after you've heard us kind of throw some things at you. So I want you to, to go back to your menti.com and then think about the same question we asked you at the beginning. What words come to mind now when you think of campaign finance laws. I'm just kind of curious to see if you still have the same ideas, if any ideas have changed, and if your words have changed. Just kind of go there and kind of, kind of throw them in. Well, folks are, there, are doing that. Can we field some questions? Certainly, I'm gonna go back to the, we've had quite a few questions. So I kind of go back. Some of them I know have already been answered in the chat. Um, but I'm going to kind of go back and kind of go review some of those. So um, I know one of the questions that Everett had asked was, how will the disclosure reports be advertised to the public? Juan, would you like to answer oh, that question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I believe Dale answered that in chat, but I'll just repeat his answer. So all campaign finance contributions would be posted on the city's portal or our campaign finance portal if one is developed. Um, and they'll be available electronically 24 seven. Uh, and Mayor Pertem Johnston uh, mentioned that the local media like the Sentinel will hopefully be paying closer attention as our races are getting more and more interesting here and impactful. Um, and we'll also be broadcasting that uh, through their print medium and also through their digital reach as well. Uh, and, you know, it's really, really critical that local media pays attention to local races because what happens honestly at City Hall impacts your lives far more than what happens in Washington the vast majority of the time. Great. Thank you so much. So here's another question I'm going to throw out to someone emailed. email. Also, um, what about those with deep pockets? from other campaigns who don't mind paying fines. What, how is that going to be handled with our new ordinance? Well, <laughs> <laughs> with the updated fining structure, if someone, uh, whether they're an individual, um, which I think is a lot less likely than the latter, which would be an independent expenditure committee, uh, AKA a super PAC, uh, if they are intent on flouting our campaign finance law, they will be uh, subject to penalties up to $10,000. Just for comparison, the current penalty, I think the maximum is $50 a day for like 15 days or something like that. And then after that, we stop charging them. So it's, it's literally, you know, um, not even an inconvenience. It may as well not even be there uh, based off of how much money some of these organizations drop in, like, you know, six figures. So... Yeah, uh, we think that 10,000 uh, will definitely get their attention. <laughs> we hope so anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, let me see here. I'm trying to go back. I don't want to miss any of the questions. 
Uh, this was not a question. This was just a comment that somebody made. And um, so who had to leave early that this person wanted to make sure that uh, we are, will be emailing our next steps. So yes, we're going to get to that and share with you how you can get involved. Um, so don't despair. We all, that's kind of a one of the reasons why we're have holding this uh, little town hall here today, we want to make sure that you guys have some information. And then also we, we need you, we need you desperately in respect to how, how we can move this forward. And there's many, many ways that people as a citizen can get involved. And I think Owen had a kind of a comment he wanted to share about that, about oh, sure. citizens yeah. getting involved. I mean, a great example of, um, this is a, a really a citizens uh, originated ordinance. And, you know, we have in the room here, Dale Nichols, who's been answering some questions in chat, but Dale is an Auroran, longtime Auroran, and very involved in paying attention to local politics. And this is, you know, something that a lot of citizens recognize that we've got problems with campaign finance, and Dale decided to do something about it and you know has been brainstorming for years and and talking to more and more people and started drafting this proposal last winter and then has you know reached out to other folks including most of us in this coalition and and some very receptive council members to uh to bring it to the point where city council is ready you know to consider it to vote on it and hopefully to enact it so there's really no limit to what you how you can be involved and how you can engage and how you can make a difference as a member of the community in Aurora. And Dale's a great example of that. I, uh, I second what you just said. That's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely, we could not be where we are today without Dale's commitment to all of this. So thank you, Dale. He goes, he just kind of, we just kind of, <laughs> it goes like that. Yeah. Oh, what the heck. Uh, I I just want to underline one more time that this is actually a homegrown initiative by a longtime Aurora resident with a lot of professional experience dealing it with campaign finance uh, and the Secretary of State's office. So I'm honestly just really thankful that we have Dale in our community and that he cares enough about our city to spend the time to write such a thorough piece of legislation. So thank you, Dale. And, and if I may add to that, I, I agree with all of that. and. You know, sometimes um, Councilmember Marcano and I may have gotten a little criticism that we haven't written this directly ourselves, but I'm, I'm proud that it was initiated by a resident who's really been someone that I've leaned on for years, digging into campaign finance reports. And then, of course, we have Linda and Susan and other constituents, as well as these organizations, when I hear, oh, you know, Common Cause Colorado and Clean Slate and PDA and, and these different groups, that makes me proud. These are subject matter experts who yep. have been having such a uh, success rate with making meaningful change. So, what, you know, I, I want to, in full transparency, want to say sometimes that might be given as a um, criticism, but I, I embrace it all. I, I think that's what makes this really effective and how we can be successful with getting it passed. So thank you. Well, thank you to both of you for that's for those comments. And as a longtime Aurora resident, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart as well, too. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go back to a couple more questions and then maybe you can go back. And then after that, we can go back to the, we have a couple more mentees that we want to um, share with all of you. So it looks like there's a question from Gary that says, will there be filters implemented on emails? Uh, no, <laughs> I think IP has learned their lesson. Um, and that's not going to happen going forward. If you send, send any of us an email and you don't hear back from us, please let us know because we need to follow up with IT ASAP. Yeah. And, and I would just say, I don't, I don't use the word filter. I do set up folders. So mm -hmm. I have, you know, police reform, minimum wage, so I can go back and then see who are my, my ward residents. Um, but yes, I, we, we do, in, in full disclosure though, we do get thousands of emails. So it may take us a little time to go through those, but it's still it's still meaningful to get all of that. So thank yeah. you. 
And if I may, I'm going to kind of combine a couple questions here to kind of in the essence of time, I'm looking at our time factor here. So um, one person was concerned about how to stop the contributions from anyone but a person with a maximum amount. And that kind of ties into another qu question of somebody who's really concerned about how dark money is going to affect the campaign finance reform. Yeah. Okay. Um, Juan, do you mind if I jump in? No, you can go first. Really? That's fine. I okay. talk too much. Go for it. <laughs> uh, no, no, you're good. Um, I'm first going to do the one that I'm clear about <laughs> in terms of dark money affecting campaign finance reform. To be honest, with Citizens United, um, we have some, some restrictions. Dark money is going to occur. But how we're going to try to counter that is by disclosing it, by being transparent and having requirements of having to disclose that information in timely in a timely way. Right now, a lot of that disclosure honestly doesn't happen until after after the race. So we've made a lot of changes to do early reporting. Again, if they don't comply, there are some significant fines. So um, it will still occur, but you all will be able to to look and see what's happening and and who's behind that. And the, the the question before that, I'm trying to I mean, can we stop. That. Is that the can we stop contribution from anyone but a person with a maximum amount? I don't know what that means. Juan, do you know Councilmember yeah. Marcano? The way I you can call me Juan, it's okay. okay. <laughs> we we both knew each other by first name before yes. we were on yes. the same body. Uh, so yeah, the way I interpret that question is, can we basically limit contributions to natural persons and set a limit? Oh. Uh, and the answer is yes, actually. But um, that kind of goes into, I think, a comment that uh, ties into a comment that Everett um, put into chat as well, uh, concerns about dark money. So the way the ordinance is currently drafted, um, I think it, the limit is $320 per uh, cycle per natural person. Um, and the reason the number is 320 is because it's, it's 80% of a state, uh, a state legislative candidate's limit and our wards are about 80% the size of the state legislator, legis uh, legislative house district, by God, words are hard, um, when, uh, in terms of population. So we felt 320 was a good place to start. Um, so that would be that limit. But part of the concern is that, well, you know, some of these currently extremely well-financed um, candidates are going to then just get their support through independent expenditures or dark money. Um, and that is a possibility. Um, I don't think it'll personally, I don't, I don't think it's a good look if you're unable to actually generate any kind of grassroots support and you're basically depending on these, you know, allegedly uncoordinated expenditures from, you know, outside dark money groups. What does that really say about your candidacy? So, um, I don't think that it's going to be a popular thing to do that uh, in, in light of these reforms. Uh, that said, there uh, is a lot to be said for public financing as well to combat that. That is not a part of this ordinance, but that is something that uh, will be hopefully coming soon once we uh, develop a strategy for that. Because um, that's really how you uh, completely open up the doors and make running for office accessible to people who have genuine grassroots support uh, and don't have to be even a little bit well-connected. Okay, thank you for that. So this is another one that, um, again, goes back to the legality of it all. So a question is, under this proposal, what would legally constitute campaign spending or campaign contributions? Are there any political organizations that would be exempt from the disclosure requirements or the, con or the excuse me, the contribution limitations. And again, that's something that's in the ordinance. So Nicole or Awan, would you like to respond to that? I was just gonna bring up the self-funding one. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only exception. Um, and that was actually based on, I believe it went to the state Supreme Court. Yes. Um, that we cannot we cannot prevent someone from self-funding their campaign. Um, one of the suggestions from our election commission, because we did present our, our ordinance to our council election commission, which our council appointees was, well, if they are self-funding, then they you know, should be exempt from reporting. And, and council member Marcano and I were like, nope, 
you may be on the state Supreme Court says you can contribute as much as you want um, if you're self-funding, but we still legally in this are requiring people to itemize all of their, their expenses on the campaign. Um, I don't think there's any other exemptions to that. And please nope. correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's the I, only one, again, because of the state Supreme Court's decision. Exactly. I believe that's correct. Thanks. Okay. Well, we do some other questions, but I think I'm going to take a little break for questions to give Nicole and Wanda time to breathe for a second. And then if Sydney could pull up the last mentee there for you, that would be really fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so now that we've kind of been chatting for about an hour now, again, we're gonna visit a question that we kind of touched upon earlier. And I, we're just kind of curious to see if you have some, a new understanding or if, um, or not. So what words come to mind when you think of how fa finance words, excuse me, campaign finance laws should be? How, how should they be? Not how they are currently, but after you've heard us all chit chat and kind of share our information and, share our knowledge and what's going to be put forth in, in this ordinance to the city council. What should, what words, what should it be? Not how do we want it? And what's going to work for the city of Aurora? Accessible, enforceable, thorough, grassroots, measured. I see some great words here. Public financing again, equitable, monitored. Okay, great, thank you. I, look, look, I guess that tells us that we've at least done our job a little bit with sharing some information with you. And we're just kind of, and I'm just kind of curious as um, how you all think with respect to what's next and how you can get involved. How many of you hopefully are ready to get involved with some things? That's kind of what kind of where we're going to go next. And I'm not sure if this is my part or not, so forgive me, but I'm gonna put this something in the chat that will kind of help you with that. That we have a link here <clears throat> that will that I'm sharing with you now in the chat. So that if you want to get involved, there are many, many different ways you can. Just sign up. That way we have your contact information and when we need you, we will, we will contact you. You can always contact one of us. And so this is kind of a quicker way as opposed to having to put all of our email addresses in the chat for you to contact. This is a great little form that just kind of tells you us who you are, what, what you want, what your strengths are and what you want, how you want to get involved. You won't get spammed. No, you will not. I promise. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Uh, one might, you know, want to spam you a little bit, but I, I don't know. I don't think he has time. I would never. <laughs> so while you're while you're looking at that, I, it looks like we have some more questions that are popping up here. So forgive me if I'm not intentionally skipping your, skipping your question. If I've done that, forgive me. I'm trying to do, trying to make sure. I kind of scrolling back here to make sure. One of the questions um, was. Uh, a question about whether Curtis Gardner was on board with this proposal. I'll speak to that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm lobbying my colleagues. Um, Curtis Gardner is an at-large council member representing the entire city. And he actually, shortly after he was elected, was drafting a campaign finance reform ordinance. Um, but talk to me. Um, and said, I will be open to working with you and um, pulled his ordinance. So it is an issue that's important to him. His original ordinance did have limits, um, did have a lot of the similarities that we have. Ours is much more robust. Um, so he has some concerns, um, but I, he has not committed as a yes. Um, but as not committed as a no. So um, meeting with him 
this week and um, we're, we're working. So you can, you can send him some friendly, friendly reminders if you'd like. As an at-large <laughs> person, he represents all of Aurora um, residents. So it's important to reach out to our at-large folks. I think Owen had his hand up. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just add that um, Council Member uh, Gardner was part of a committee that has already heard the ordinance and reviewed the ordinance and taken a vote on the ordinance. And um, he voted uh, a positive vote in terms of moving the ordinance on to city council. So that's a good sign. And if you're contacting him, you might thank him for his support so far and, and giving it a thumbs up in committee. Um, I, I do think um, he still needs encouragement. And uh, you know, so contacting him with thanks and further encouragement is probably effective. And if I could add a little to that as well, too, I think that kind of shows how important it is for us to attend these city council meetings that are coming up and just be part of that conversation. Let your voice be heard. I mean, just, you're, you're taking part in democracy, and that's the most important thing you can do at this point, I believe. Those are my, that's my two cents worth on this. So thank you for letting me speak to that. I think there's a couple, another couple questions I inadvertently skipped. Um, is it illegal here to reimburse others for contributing as you wish? Yes. Well, under this ordinance, especially, yes, but yes. <laughs> yeah, and that in the ordinance is, is identified as a conduit contribution, and those are illegal. And, and to answer Christy's question, no, first of all, Christy, no, you're not being lazy, but the question was, do we have form letters for your, for support? Um, I didn't put one together, so <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, yeah, that's, some, that's something easy to do, so that's why I encourage you to, um, to fill out the form, and I could put that in the chat again, too. Let me do that again. And then we can get that we can get that form to you as well too. It's really really important. We do and have thank you for signing up, Christy. We do have kind of a one sheet of highlights also that um, would be a a good resource to draw on if you're writing a letter. Uh, you know, Council M Member Marcano and and Pro Mayor Pro Tem Johnston could probably give us some insight on how they respond to form letters, but. Um, you know, it, it, it probably is always helpful as much as you can personalize something. And if you can draw on some of the big points that we can provide, um, that might be a nice balance, a nice combination, getting that personal input. Yes, I'm just gonna speak for myself, but I'd rather see one and a half sentences of a personal message than a copy and paste form letter. Yeah. But you, I mean, I, I think, you know, literally even just one sentence and mm -hmm. it being personal from you is, is more personal. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so for me, I, I, I like that, but I've also been on the other end of sending things and it's just nice to like, I want to get this message out, copy paste, and they know how I feel. So I understand that too. Yeah, I do want to echo that. I think a personal message, even if it's very, very short and sweet uh, is... I think infinitely more impactful than a form letter. But again, I don't know your schedule. So if that's all you can do, that's still great. Okay, so I'm checking and I believe I have, we have covered all of the questions in the chat unless somebody, if I've forgotten it, missed yours, forgive me, it was not intentional. And you can please put it in there again. Maybe I just didn't scroll back far enough. Uh, let's see here. Here's a, a question. Uh, someone asked about talking points. We do have a, a one page talking point sheet that we can share with you. So yes, that, that's a possibility. I'll just answer that one on my own. Another question, is it possible this proposal could inadvertently force us to turn to candidates who can self fund if we are faced with a larger onslaught of dark money? Um, that's again, that's kind of a, it's an interesting take. Um, that's part of why I think, you know, this is a great first step, but we need to definitely address a public match 
Um, like, I don't know if y'all are familiar with what Seattle has done with their democracy vouchers uh, program. I think that that's exceptionally successful. Um, we don't have that kind of budget here. Uh, so we might end up doing something maybe a little similar to what Denver uh, does, or at least proposing, I should say, um, something a little more similar to what Denver does with the match. Um, but honestly, Richard, if we ever got to that point, I would say that we're in really, really deep trouble, just generally speaking. <laughs> um, I, I think that, like I said, this will help uh, make elections more accessible to folks who are not well connected, uh, because you won't be able to fund a campaign off of $100,000 donations for mayor, for example, or, you know, two, one and two and $4,000 a pop for wards. You'll actually have to know people. Uh, and if someone is running and they get the bulk of their money, uh, not even, you know, to them, but through independent expenditure committees, that's, again, that says a lot as to who they're going to serve and how much popular support they actually have. And I think that that is a really compelling story um, that these kinds of transparency measures will tell um, and the people have a right to know that. Uh, Owen? Yeah, uh, just to echo a couple of things there. Um, one, to, the one way that people are able to limit um, uh, self-funding is when they have an opt-in program. So when you have when you institute an opt-in program where candidates can opt in for to to play by a different set of rules um, that are generally more restrictive than everybody else is playing by, um, you know taking smaller contributions, eliminating special interest contributions, and you can include in that um, limiting um, self-funding to, to the same amount that uh, anybody else can contribute to a campaign. So there is the option always to, to create an opt-in system, and that's what uh, Seattle does, that's what most people who have public financing do, that's an optional uh, path for candidates to take. Um, the other piece, just to echo Council Member Marcano again, is that when, when we have that disclosure component and you're seeing where the money is coming from, that really has an effect on voters. Voters are getting more and more educated on this issue. And when they see that a candidate is funded by you know, an enormous amount of money from a particular special interest group or that all of their funding comes from themselves, um, that weighs in their evaluation, their assessment of that candidate. It makes a big difference. And again, you know, if you look at uh, cleanslatenowaction.org, we have reports, you can look under reports, and we, we lay out all the recent Aurora campaigns. And this is the way it would be once we get the transparency in effect for Aurora, you'd be able to see something similar of seeing where the money comes from, how much of it is coming from, um, corporations how much, and special interests, how much is coming from out of state or out of Aurora, um, how much is small dollar donations, and that illumination shedding the light on things is a fantastic sanitizer for this dirty money in our elections. Okay, thank okay. you for that. Um, I'm looking at the time here and I'm getting some messages. We started a few minutes late, so we kind of, kind of went over a few more minutes, but um, Thank you everyone for being here. And I'm gonna kind of turn things over to Amanda. I apologize if we did not get to all of your questions, but if feel free to um, email, uh, you know, I can't even talk today, forgive me, too many meetings. Um, email either Juan or Nicole, and I'm sure they will get back to you and answer your questions in a very timely ma manner because that's who they are. So Amanda, take it away. Thank you so much everybody for spending your evening um, with all of us. I did put the link to get involved with the campaign um, in the chat just one last time. So we would love to talk with you, talk with your group, um, get your feedback on um, the information that we covered tonight. And of course, have you participate in those upcoming city council meetings. Um, your voice is really important to this process. Um, we are all trying to make a democracy and a campaign finance system that works for all of us, that is transparent and feels fair. And thank you so much for being part of that process um, because we are all in this together. Ultimately, it is the voters and the people that have the power. Um, we just all need to make sure that we're exercising it. So thank you again for being here. Thank you to both of our council members for all of your hard work and for fielding uh, tough questions tonight. Um, and I hope that this is um, just the beginning of many conversations to come. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.